Hi and welcome to another Tabitha's Glass Emporium YouTube video. As we know this month is pattern bars and I thought I'd show you a bit of how to make your own pattern bar if you want. Now there's lots of different ways to make pattern bars. I've got a few examples down here if we can get the sander to pan down. I've just made them wet so you can sort of see the pattern much more easily. So um, Bullseye have a very good resource for making a couple of different types of pattern bar. If you haven't signed up to um, Bullseye's resource I think it's 45 US dollars a year and you get amazing resources. Um, this particular one over here is made with a bullseye resource and um, there's this type of one as well. This is called um, a segment slab and this is called a flow slab and you can see how to make those on bullseye so I'm not going to kind of explain how to make those. Um, that is a flow slab there. These are kind of flow slabs but they're um, Flow slabs, you use uh, quite a lot of uh, height in them to make the glass to move, whereas I haven't used so much height in these. And then you've got kind of simple things like pattern bars like this, which was literally just sort of um, glass sort of piled up with powders in there and using some um, textured glass. Uh, so that's, you know, accordion glass and some a bit of kind of reactions going on there as well. I quite like this piece because you can kind of see into it and you get the sort of, um, sort of depth, which is always hard to show on a camera. Um, so uh, I'm going to kind of talk through various different ways about making pattern bars and the ones I use. So one of the main things you need to think about when you're doing a pattern bar is the volume of glass you need. And it's easiest, we normally think about it in weight. Now it's easily done if you're talking about a square. So if you've got a square, and you want to work it out, you're going to work out the volume. So it's 16 by 20 by 2.3 is 736. And then to get the weight of bullseye glass, bullseye is a, and this will vary. If you're using a different glass, don't use 2.5, but bullseye is 2.5. And you times this volume by this, and that gives you the weight of the glass, one kilo, 8.4. So that's the amount of weight I need to fill up this particular shape. So it's easy to do it when it's a square, but when you've got a shape like this, it can be harder. Now you can fill this up with frit and sort of work out, but frit's got a lot of holes in. So the other method I do, and basically what I do is I do this once for a mold and then I take a photograph and keep a note and then I know that is the particular weight for um, a, any given, this, that particular mold. So this is called water displacement method. Now I've got a jug and I kind of know that my line on the jug with water is like this here. Then I fill up the mould to where I want it. I'm then going to discard that water and I don't need to do that. So I'm going to put that one to one side and here's one I made earlier. And then you basically fill up the jug to bring the water line back up to the, air, the place you had it at before. So now the amount of um, glass in here is filling the jug up to the space I need. Then I'm going to discard all the water in the jug. And then, you know, I've got water, you know, the problem is the, the, the glass is wet, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. And then I'm going to put it on a set of scales and weigh the glass. Now you're going to have a little bit of um, weight for water, but more or less, I know that this mould needs about 950 grams of bullseye glass. Again, this is well, actually with the water displacement method, you would need to use the glass you're using. If you wanted to use Gaffer or System 96 glass, then you need to make sure that that is the glass going in because it will displace a different amount of water. So this is the water displacement method. So that's another way of doing it. Now, the other last way of thing to think about is let's say you want to do a circle. So you might have a circular mould like this and you want to fill this with glass up to a certain level. Now this is kind of harder, unless you're good at maths, which I'm not, uh, and can work out your kind of volume um, using probably Pythagoras theorem, I should imagine, someone out there tell me, uh, then maybe you can't do this. So, and this is Yvette, thank you for you to um, explaining this one to me. So pretend, because I used to have a smaller one of these and I can't find it, which was this size. So pretend this is the same size. So you cut yourself a circle of the size of the ring. You can then weigh that circle so let's say, I just need something on here to, 
So this circle weighs, this is the most stupid idea ever. This circle weighs 612 grams. Now that's three millimeters thick. So if I want a slab, you know, two centimeters thick, I need to divide it, you know, two centimeters by three millimeters and times it by that to get the weight of the glass I need for the circle. I hope this is making sense. It makes sense in my head, but lots of things make sense in my head that then don't make sense in the real world. So those are your different ways of working out volume. Now we're gonna move on to making a couple of different pattern bars. So one way of making a pattern bar is to dam an area like this. So I've just used, these are kiln posts. Whenever you're using a pattern bar, I personally think it's good to do it on a, a newly done, a newly prepared kiln shelf, not using paper, but with wash. Um, so that's what this is. I've then used three millimeter fiber paper all around. So I don't know if you can kind of point at the camera into here um, to protect the edge of the, of the posts. Now I'm going to use one of these. Now I got these off um, uh, Donny Boom, Bonny Doom, <laughs> sorry, that lorry um, in the States. Uh, um, so I got one of those and you can basically, you, so I've calculated the area, which is on my you know, beautiful bit of paper here. 16 centimetres by 20, I want it about um, 2.3. The fibre paper is cut to two millimetres. I want to go slightly above the fibre paper. It gives a nice kind of roll over at the end. You don't want your fibre paper too much higher because then it has a tendency of falling in and that's not so good. So then that times 2.5 gives me a weight of glass of one kilo 84. So I've taken this mould and I basically stacked it full of one kilo 24 of glass and this will just go on here and it will go on. It goes up to quite a high temperature. So it's above a full fuse. You want it to sort of drip through. Then it basically drips through these holes into this and we'll make a pattern below. And we can see how that comes out versus other methods we're going to use. So the next one method you can use is you can get a stainless steel mold like I showed you earlier. So the one like this. Um, I got some again from the same place I got these from um, with sort of uh, some um, metal bits like this. And then I had like this one made by a local blacksmith. There's some good blacksmiths in England. I know there's Tommy Blacksmith and I think there's a guy called Shane, um, kind of on Facebook that you can use. Um, the idea of these is that the glass dribbles through and you get some nice sort of patterns like this. If you can imagine it's this way up and the glass is sort of dribbled through on the things. So I know the weight of the glass for this particular mould is a kilo, um, a kilo 75 and I've basically cut up some glass adding up to the weight of a kilo 75. I suggest when you're doing this you do this in the kiln don't try and do it out the kiln and then move it it's a disaster and you just are basically stacking up your glass making sure it's inside the um the mold and I tend to just stack up in fact I'm gonna so contrasting colours and I might even do a kind of thicker layer of something on top. That piece of glass is too big, so I'm going to need to cut it down. You know, I need to even watch out. This one is a little bit on the big side too, although it'll probably be all right. Um, so you can just sort of stack up glass like this on top. And it can be quite tricky. This is why, you know, using scraps like this for this method is maybe not so advisable because it's just too hard to get it all on, on top of this without the whole thing tumbling over. It's like a kind of game of, I don't know, some dastardly game uh, where you need to stack all the bits of glass on top of each other. Um, so for these, because I want the pattern the sort of colours to be the same all the way through the pattern bar as well, particularly because I'm selling them commercially. But even if I was using them, I tend to try and kind of, as you can see, have the same colour stretching all the way across the pattern bar. Um, so I would sort of do it like this and then it would stretch all across. And again, you can put this, you put this on a, a schedule. Um, I'm pretty sure on Bonnie Doon, she has a schedule for these because this is where I bought them. And it's a good one to do this kind of um, uh, both of these in Fahrenheit to do this kind of thing. So these are two different types so far of how to kind of, you know, um, make, you know, different pattern bars. Another little idea for a pattern bar I've got, which is very extravagant because it's a lot of Marini, is to make a bundle of Marini like this. 
So this is lots of marini tied up together. You can just tie it up with sellotape, that will burn off in the kiln. And then I'm gonna put it in here and full fuse it and it will go turn to a square um, pattern bar, but it's gonna look really beautiful. Um, this one I want to show you, which is just a how to make a little landscape pattern bar. Um, so similar to this, no, no pattern bars the same, but this one will be similar. So I created these little kind of um, uh, pattern bar areas, dammed and with fibre paper. Now, this, these ones I have taken the fibre paper up higher than I think the pattern bar is, and I'm not going to wear, measure or weigh, because I'm just going to build it up and put it in. So I've cut some glass. Some that's decided to spike my finger. Um, some kind of sheet glass, some stringers. All to sort of, you know, close to the width of the, the length of the pattern bar. And I'm just putting them in, in a fairly, as you see, haphazard fashion. Now I want to put some flowers in, so I'm gonna use, I'm not gonna do it just as poppy as this one. I'm gonna do a kind of, um, um, a, a selection of kind of different flowers in a meadow. And I also sort of want to make sure that the, the flowers are sort of separated from each other. So I'm carrying on building kind of green up around in between the flowers before I maybe put another flower in, let's say, there. It's harder for me to see from this angle. And it's nice to use kind of lights and darks and kind of different tones of green because it gives you the feeling of kind of, um, you know, shadows and light of, the, of a kind of meadow. Um, again, you know, putting these in as well. Smaller bits of aventurine. Another few flowers in. And I'm sort of building up these layers. A bit more here and there, and I might just add a last couple of flowers. And you could do this without using marini, you could use kind of rods, um, you could, you know, uh, using this method here. You could, you know, take a, let's say you had a, uh, a rod that thick, you could bundle, um, you know, other uh, stringers around it to make a little flower of your own. So there are ways of doing it if you don't want to kind of um, pay for marini. Or you could just use coloured frit throughout and the coloured frit would be like, um, like the flowers. It wouldn't like run all the way through, but it would just be similar. So that's kind of my green area. Now I want to do kind of blue on top. Now I've got some just scrap blue glass here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to put a plaster on, I am bleeding. So this is an idea I've had and it's a complete kind of um, experiment. So you're coming along with me for the ride and sometimes it's nice to do experiments. The idea of this is to try and do a tree, but half of a tree, so that when you open it out, you have a kind of full tree. And you know, in my head it works, but sometimes in my head it works and in real life it doesn't. So at the bottom of this pattern bar, I put what will effectively be the main kind of trunk of the tree. And then I want to sort of create some branches. Now I've made a mix here of different screens and frit and some red, which I'm gonna kind of put like this across. And then I'm going to put this in like it's a branch of the tree. And then put another like branch of the tree in. Um, now at the bottom, you know, I want some kind of green area of kind of um, garden with perhaps some flowers. So I'm just going to put those in.
trying to separate the flowers out. I'm just using the leftovers from the other pattern bar I did in here. And then I'm going to put some more of this, which is kind of the top of the tree. In a minute, I'll get it off the edge of these bits before I put it in the kiln. And I'm going to fill up this side with a bit more scrap green. So here it is. I've added a bit of blue on top, um, some other scrappy stringers as well. And this will go in. I'm not sure this will work. I have no idea, but let's give it a go. I might cut it out. You may not get to see this. Um, and we'll see how these come are when they come out. So here it is all in the kiln. As you can see, it's quite messy. The metal bars put shards of glass all over it. I'm now going to put a mask on and clean up this all. I'm going to use my um, vacuum cleaner to suck up all the uh, fibre paper and clean as much as possible with that with a mask on before I do anything else. So here's this one out of the kiln. I've made sure I have my mask on and I've hoovered off all the fibre paper around the side. I'm not going to wash it yet because I'm actually going to take it in the sandblaster and give it a clean up. Um, I'm just going to show it in front of the window. So this is self-filming because I'm on my own. It's rather beautiful as it is, so I'm almost a bit sad to cut it up. But I am going to, to show you how it is on the inside. Um, and I will give it a sandblast. If you have one, if not, you just have to clean it up and probably cut the edges off or grind the edges off, depending on what equipment you have. I thought you might be interested in seeing my sandblaster set up. This is a very, very cheap sandblaster off eBay, um, you know, a couple of hundred quid, nothing very expensive at all. I have a connected to it a Henry um, vacuum cleaner, which as you can see is gaffer taped into here. The light is the only thing I changed at the sandblaster. I used Per Yvette and Craig's recommendation, recommendation from um, Glass Studio Supplies to change it to um, a mechanics car bonnet you know, under a car bonnet um, light. So that's kind of redone in. And then that is the most expensive thing. The thing you want to spend your money on when you're doing sandblasting is a compressor. This is an expensive compressor, it's a thousand euros, but it's worth it and it really does the job for me. So before we take a final look at the pattern bars, I just want to talk to you about equipment. Now I'm lucky, I have a big Dewalt tile saw and I have two different tile saw blades, a thicker one that I'm using at the moment to cut up pattern bars or a very fine one I use when I'm cutting up the Marini I sell. Um, this is, gives them a very nice finish uh, on the Marini. Um, so depending on what I want to do, do I, um, what I'm doing, I change the tile saw blade around. Now I use this, this is my safety equipment. They're probably quite hard to get hold of at the moment because everyone wants them for Corona. But this, you know, covers your face, really keeps you safe and is the best thing for when you're using tile saws or kind of lots of cold working equipment. Now most of you, this is going to be on your budget and you can't afford this. So your other options to get the smaller tile saw like this. This is my first tile saw I have, I still have it. Um, this one I got from B&Q, it's a compact XL. Your thing with tile saws are, you want to think about is the, um, um, is the quality of the blade. But what you've got to remember with a tile saw is you're restricted by the height of the pattern bar. So. If you want to do a big curve pattern bar, you're not going to be able to cut it on this tile saw blade or a lot of the triangle pattern bars you see out there that look fantastic. This blade will not do them. You can do kind of smaller, probably a centimetre and a half, two centimetre pattern bars on this. Anything bigger will be impossible. But it's a great starting um, piece of equipment. It works well. I know lots of people out there who just use this all the time and don't have anything bigger and they find it brilliant. So that is an option to start with. So here they are and they've, I've sandblasted them and cleaned up all the edges and I've cut a couple of slices off so we can have a look. I'm um, starting at this end. These are the ones using the stainless steel um, formers and then metal stainless steel to melt the glass over. So you get these interesting kind of swirly patterns through them. Um, just um, having a think about it. So this one, is using mostly opal glass. There's a tiny bit of transparent, but it's mostly opal glass, so it's quite dense. Whereas this one, we've used a lot of transparents and you get a lot more kind of light coming through. So this is considerations you want to think about when you're making your pattern bars. Do I want light coming through or don't I? Um, the next ones are the kind of more landscapey ones. Now, I'm honest, I should have taken more time with these. They're not as good as I would like them to be. They're still interesting, don't get me wrong, but. They weren't quite what I was planning. I think it's because I rushed them. 
So this is my kind of tree one. I think it's interesting. It almost looks like a stag, I feel like a, um, a kind of um, a slightly weird stag. Um, and um, then these ones are sort of with the landscapes. I put a lot of transparency in the sky. And in fact, I should have put some opals. So they, in a way, they feel a bit like under the sea, um, under the sea landscape and with the kind of sea on top, which I rather like. Um, then after that, we've got these two pattern bars, which are more kind of detailed. This one is um, the Marini one, which I love. I just think it's got such an amazing kind of feel to it. It looks totally beautiful. Um, and then these, which are just the kind of scrappy stringers. Um, I'm probably going to sell these in kind of lots of two that you can just sort of put together like this. And they're sort of beautiful kind of um, out of the world feel to them. Um, so, you know, and that, again, these ones were literally just putting your glass in, kind of working it out and letting it sink together into a pattern bar. And then finally, we've got the one where we used the um, uh, uh, terracotta. In fact, I've got it right here. We use this. Um, to, and we put the glass in and as you can see it melted and you've got this sort of beautiful, uh, I almost feel that it's a shame to cut it up but I have started, um, totally totally beautiful um, thing and then when you cut it up you get these and the, these sort of bits here are just gorgeous. Um, I kind of think they might be amazing for jewellery if you then cut them up a, up a bit more and use them in jewellery or I'm going to use them in a project I've got in mind. Um, so that is the different ones. You know, you have the other, you know, techniques you can use. There's the um, balls. I have a couple. There are, you know, other people out there who have various different techniques. I know Dale has got a fantastic um, pattern bar book with um, using Marini, which I've got, which is fantastic. And have a look at that and get that if you, you can get hold of um, um, good Marini. That's, a, you know, really like kind of makes phenomenally great pattern bars I love that book so there's lots of different things you can do with pattern bars guys um have a think have a look and um if you've liked this video please subscribe